Thank you everyone for attending. And I wanna also thank uh, People's Forum for helping organize this event today. My name is Luna. I work alongside Belly of the Beast, which is a Havana-based media collective made up of Cubans and foreigners with the goal of exposing US policy effects on everyday Cuban life through investigative journalism and film. Um, so for the past few months, Belly of the Beast has put out articles and videos and research and graphics that focus on US interventionist policy in Cuba. Um, and most importantly, the highlight for me is that since the COVID-19 pandemic started, sanctions have actually intensified on the island, which has affected access to food and energy and medicine. Um, and the Trump administration and organizations like Human Rights Watch have spread propaganda about the brigades of Cuban doctors, calling them slaves and using this language to justify more sanctions. Um, so Belly of the Beast is gonna release a four part documentary in October that's gonna expose US interventionist policy that's been strangling the island uh, for decades and has only gotten worse with the Trump administration. Um, so to look out for that documentary, please subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, and then I also wanna say that like, as a young person in the United States, uh, I just wanna take a moment to touch on how important it is like this work, um, because I believe that since Cuban everyday livelihood is affected by US tax dollars and politics, it's really important that those of us who live in the United States understand deeply what happens in Cuba um, and what it really means to have sanctions on people. Um, so I think we all need to understand what it means to make our struggle global. And in order to do that, we've decided to put together this event called uh, Lessons on Cuba. It's gonna be a whole series to re-energize the political relationship with the US left anti-racist movements and struggle towards justice with Cuba's uh, struggles towards sovereignty. Um, so it's gonna be a whole series that looks at different aspects of the relationship, uh, but today is the first event. Um, so I am gonna uh, introduce my first two guests, James Early and Devin Springer. Um, James Early has spent 45 years traveling to socialist Cuba in solidarity with the Cuban Ministry of Culture, traditional and plastic artists and intellectuals. Um, he's a former director of Cultural Heritage Policy Center for Folklife Programs and Cultural Studies at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and his applied research explores cultural democracy, statecraft policy, capitalist and socialist discourse in, discourses in cultural policy, um, Afro-Latin politics, history, and cultural democracy. And then we have Devin Springer, who's a community organizer, writer, cultural worker, and independent researcher who studies African and African diaspora history and art history. Um, as a community organizer, they have worked with various groups in Atlanta, and across the US South and Global South. Um, and in 2018, they helped form ACERE, which is a diaspora group of the Red Barrial Afrodescendiente, um, which organizes community education around blackness, race, and racism in Cuba. Um, oh, and they're also the digital outreach coordinator for the Walter Rodney Foundation, led by the family of the late revolutionary Walter Rodney. Um, and Devin refers to this as their intellectual activism and radical awakening home. So thank you both for being here today and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much for a wonderful introduction. Um, also thank you for, to Belly of the Beast as well as the People's Forum for having us and putting this together. It's not every day that I get to be in conversation with someone uh, of the stature and experience and knowledge as, as James Early. And so I wanna thank him as well for you know being in conversation with me. Um, and I, I kind of just want to start off jumping right in. And I, I want to ask you, James, how you got started in this Cuba solidarity work that has now spanned for decades. I just want to sort of know where your personal interest and involvement began, if you don't mind sharing. Very good. Well, first, let me thank uh, the two of you, uh, this young adult generation who is now taking the lead um, literally across the world and certainly as reflected in the large uh, broad banner of Black Lives Matter in the United States, which has catalyzed uh, activism across Latino and queer and Asian Pacific American and white American communities uh, across different ideological perspectives uh, to really look at the nature of the society in which we live, uh, looking at the issue of the centrality of racism in, in that context. Uh, your generation is now the generation that has inherited the work of uh, the 70 plus year olds like myself uh, and others who came before me. And so I really appreciate that. Uh, 
I also want to acknowledge the People's Forum. Um, it is a very preciously important uh, forum, the People's Forum, the opportunity for people from various backgrounds who want to clearly understand the power relationships in society and in the world that shape their both individual interests and their group specific interests and to find out what are the oppositional uh, forces and outlooks uh, to that and what are the basis for coming together in common cause uh, despite uh, distinct languages, ethnicities, religions, and the like. So it is a preciously important institution and for those who will observe and engage this program, please support the People's Forum uh, and the Red Barial, uh, which is a great reflection of internationalism between uh, people from other countries uh, with citizens in Cuba. Uh, so I, I am a person, a product of the 1960s. I was born in 1947, and you look, the Cuban Revolution then comes to power in 1959. Uh, the uh, first overthrow of colonialism uh, comes in 1957 with Kwame Nkrumah, led by Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. Uh, the modern civil rights movement uh, takes another leap forward in fighting American apartheid. Uh, so that's, and I come from a product of a uh, racial apartheid in the United States in which there were not just customs, but laws that prohibited the interaction specifically uh, between blacks and whites, but that set uh, the real context for all non-whites. And we were not talking about queer communities at that point. The prejudice was so deep uh, and the exclusion uh, so deep. It was not yet the democratic question that it is today. So in that is the context of the development of my social consciousness. Uh, the Cuban revolution evolves uh, as a striking uh, opposition uh, to the status quo as we were socialized to understand the status quo, both here in the United States and around the world. And it is only later in life that I come to understand uh, the tie between the Cuban Revolution and not only the United States, but the significance of the Cuban Revolution in the context of the hemisphere in which we live. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that there were always uh, Latino or Hispanic communities in the geographical area called the United States of America. Uh, the border uh, and the national anthem changed uh, out of the barrel of the gun of U.S. expansionism to the West, but it did not change uh, the populations and the ways of knowing and doing uh, expressed uh, through the Spanish language. So, of course, predating that were indigenous communities that were always there, but the black-white dynamic because of the nature of a racialized colonialism in the whole of the American continent, were the system of uh, capitalism, the social relations of production that produced this system called capitalism was always a racialized one. And it matures in this part of the world. Uh, in that broader context, the United States then claimed dominance over this entire hemisphere uh, through uh, the Monroe Doctrine in the early 1800s. Those are things that I did not know uh, when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. But nevertheless, the excitement in 1959 of the Cuban Revolution, of these bearded revolutionaries coming and television had emerged as a really connecting forum, a connecting optic in the way that uh, today you so uh, easily and readily use internet and Zoom and Skype. Uh, that was our analog of, of the moment. We were able to see a connection of people in the world and to look at uh, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and uh, the Afro-Cuban Juan Almeida march into Havana and to see the crowds of Cubans really attentive to what they were saying some people dress finely in suits, uh, some white, uh, others working class in their physical appearance. But what they had in common is that they were all very attentive to this dynamic voice of Fidel Castro talking about issues of social justice. So for my generation, that it gave us, uh, we were not using the term necessarily internationalism but it gave us a look out of the optics of the United States in which we had been socialized. 
and it excited us, those ideas excited us. Uh, and so that's the context out of which I come to be engaged in Cuba. And of course, then the question of race and culture, because uh, African culture is highly concentrated uh, in Cuba, uh, Brazil, uh, Haiti, uh, in ways in which uh, it is expressed less in a concentrated an obvious form here in the United States. So you look at those factors of racial identity, the striking of the imagination just of any human being, but you put that together with race. Uh, and so Cuba becomes a point of attraction and focus and study. Well, and this actually sort of leads me to the next question, because you mentioned the sort of imagination that can be built within the working class in the US, particularly the black working class in seeing this example, this, right, the danger of a good example, as many would say, in the Cuban revolution. And in this era, you also have several decolonial struggles taking place across the African continent as well, some a little bit later. Um, but I imagine that to be present at that time and to have a political awakening at this time is to have a more grander and almost more ideologically sound imagination for the future of revolutionary potential and organizing. And I'm wondering if you could sort of compare and contrast a little bit the imagination, right, as, as far as it relates to the Cuban revolution, whereas on one hand you had a people who were very near to that revolution and who saw these great strides happening and so now to, to later generations who aren't as close to that experience, I do feel like there are differences there that that has created. Well, of, of course, at, at, at that time, you know, one could watch the Cuban revolution on television, uh, but as young people, um, particularly for African-Americans, uh, the most active uh, conscious uh, engagement of governance power was the struggle against American apartheid, U.S. segregation. And, and of course, uh, telephone communication, there were no fax machines, there, there was no internet. Uh, how to build a community of activism, uh, in hindsight, was a great, great challenge. And so, although we could observe uh, the Cuban Revolution uh, on television, how to engage it, how to reach it, uh, was problematic. We just did not know. In my particular case, uh, as a senior at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, rambling through the offices of the Student Nine Violet Coordinating Committee one night, the big old factory-like office, uh, the, the, the organization was basically not operating fully at that time, I came across Pensamiento Critico, Critical Thought, uh, the magazine uh, produced, I think, around 1962 by the uh, late Fernando Martinez Heredia. I mention his name, not just as a historical marker, but as someone that should be read because of his critical Marxism, his, his framework of how to critically engage society, not just ideologically uh, declare. So for me, there was that connection that, that incited me seeing the second issue of Pensamiento Critico. But for others, how might they go about that? It is only later that we get the Benzaremos Brigade of of young people, not just young African Americans, but significant numbers of Asian Pacific Americans uh, out of the state of California, for example, who get involved in the Vencerremos uh, Brigade. So we can historicize that moment, but we need to be careful in uh, seeing that moment as the model, because as communication with Cuba uh, developed, uh, we had people who then went to Cuba, Amiri Baraka, uh, the great a uh, poet, Marxist, a Leninist uh, organizer, uh, who was always in the public space, not just on the margins with ideology, but in the public space, engaging all sectors of the African-American community and some alliances with the Latino community, particularly coming out of the New York area, that we begin to foreground Cuba and we see other examples, not only of writers and artists like June, the late June Jordan, uh, the African-American, a queer poet who take a position about Cuba and engage different sectors of our society. As time evolves, then we see the developments uh, like Pastors for Peace, a black, an African-American minister who steps forth out of a deep humanism, recognizing 
uh, not so much that Marxist-Leninism, um, uh, uh, Fidel Castro thought was the framework, but it was the ideals and principles articulated in that framework by real people that he felt compelled to organize and to reach out and to show a humanistic solidarity and to examine that very closely. Then that gets built in other expressions of what are connections um, that we don't perhaps give enough attention to. Uh, I think it's 62 or so that Fidel Castro has one of these brilliant brainstorms as he was distinguished uh, by saying is, let's make sure that connected to people's ability to read and write and to be able to examine the world in which they live and the world that is being proposed to them to engage. Let's make sure that they have the critical power of literacy to express their voice and their thinking more widely than just basic social communication. Let's tie that to the issue of healthcare, which gives them a more substantial uh, background and which to be able to carry the strength of, 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 of their voice. And so this proposes this medical school. And out of this medical school, then he says, you know, we can make a contribution to the entire globe of humanity. And out of that, then particularly African-American and Latinos, but a number of white American youth who were average students who could not get into medical schools here in the United States, uh, but who if committed to serving humanity the Cubans said, we will educate you freely. Now this is very significant because the power of that humanistic view in the context of an evolving Cuban socialism also leveraged Cuba's opponents uh, expressed in the politics of the United States through the United States government. And where you had members of Congress who were anti-communist, anti-socialist, who were trying to restrict the self-determination and sovereignty of Cuba also be lifted up by that humanistic connection and said that despite the fact that we're trying to undermine the Cuban revolution on the one hand, we must preserve and protect this offer that the Cubans have made uh, to educate young people who will come back and work in underdeveloped countries. And that was both on both sides of the dominant uh, duopoly of political structure here in the United States. Uh, Congressman Charles Rangel out of New York City played a very active role as a democratically elected uh, liberal congressman supporting the goals and ideals of the US uh, capitalist economic system and its foreign arrangements. But so did Colin Powell at a later date, an African-American of Jamaican and Caribbean background on the Republican side of the house. This also all speaks to the power of the socialist project of Cuba uh, and how it is in context. So here we are now uh, in the first third almost of the 21st century. Uh, the question is, what are the particularities of this moment, both inside Cuba, as well as inside the United States and other areas uh, that we can build new connections with your generation of activists? They are there, we need to uplift them and we need to broaden them and we need to center them in the public space uh, so that uh, all people have an opportunity to bring their critical optics but many people will step beyond the point of criticism to actually taking up and learning about Cuba, uh, as is the case of the belly of the beast, for example, of young adults. And I want to express that you are adults, not just young people uh, who are taking agency themselves and building those connections. So that's, that's a, a, a comparative uh, approach or orientation, if you will from my generation uh, when I was uh, in my early 20s to your generation and what is going on now. One thing that comes to mind immediately when you say that there are uh, entities of solidarity and connection such as Pastors for Peace that may not get the attention that they deserve and that have been, I don't wanna say forgotten about, but they haven't been given the sort of prime time mainstreaming for the left that they once held. I think of the Martin Luther King Center in Havana and several events I've been to there in conjunction with the Red Barrial Afrodescendiente. And one of the things that one of the pastors there said was that the American conception of solidarity is often an aesthetic. It's an aesthetic, it is a symbolic gesture but Cubans have 
medical school to offer. At the Martin Luther King School, they train activists in radical alternative pedagogy. Um, and orienting ourselves, specifically, I think that my generation, orienting ourselves around an understanding of solidarity with Cuba that is about building a project, a larger socialist project that is about sort of a material solidarity. It can be a daunting question, but it is a necessary task. I'm wondering, in your opinion, what are, especially in the midst of this pandemic, because this has also shifted a little bit the, the ideas of, of material support and interaction, I'm wondering how you envision a sort of reinvigoration, right? A reinterest of of a of that form of solidarity. Well, I, I think in the first instance, it, it's important to identify and to elevate what actually is going on, uh, and from that point of departure, to build, expand, and deepen what is going on. Uh, I think often, uh, particularly younger generations, certainly it was the case for me in my uh, younger years, we often get uh, trapped or limited by idealism and we fail to examine how is it that we actually exist and have these uh, transformative ideas and these transformative engagements. It's because someone made the world possible for us to do that. And that then through our own activity, we are actually carrying that forth. And we often then tend to define reality from its negative point of view then, rather than from the positive point of view in which we take up the negativity. For example, anti-racism is absolutely necessary because of the racialized nature of the economic system and its plural expressions uh, throughout this hemisphere and the world uh, that qualify our lives that limit our humanity. But do we want to define ourselves simply as anti? Uh, that is the first part of the equation. The second part of the equation is to be answered in our practice and our evolving understanding of the world that we envision. To be anti, to be what? To be something new and different. Remembering that the Cuban Revolution premised that they were creating a new man uh, if it was talked about today, if the revolution were to occur, they would say, because they too would have advanced in their gender ideas, they would have said new men and women or women and men are simply new human beings. Uh, so that it's really important that we uplift what is actually going on and expand from there, because we will always be trapped by idealism if we just say how dark the world is, rather than looking at the pinhills of light that people before us and that we ourselves have created. That's what we have to have to have to build from. So what are some of those examples? I mentioned uh, pastors for peace. I mentioned the issue of the relationship uh, in the, the medical areas. Uh, we have major institutions in this country, uh, one somewhere in the Massachusetts area right now that have a collaboration with Cuba on, on a cancer drug. And that's done through despite the economic warfare through the so-called sanctions or the blockade, it's actually economic warfare uh, that's going on. That exists, it exists because people in Cuba and people in the United States have willed that to be. And this is the dynamic, the world is always contradictory and we have to find that evolving thread in what is otherwise a whole cloth that is challenging rather than simply focus on the whole cloth. So your generation, I would urge very strongly, we need to map what, what is going on in the United States. Uh, in, in Minneapolis, uh, there are cultural groups who are not socialist, who are enthralled by Cuban art and culture uh, and who are building relationships with Cuba, who are not pro-socialist, but they're not anti-socialist in the sense that they see the humanity of the Cuban people and they are attracted to that and they recognize that this is going on in a socialist society. That complexity we, we have to appreciate. There are members of, of Congress, uh, particularly within the, some, both in the Democratic and the Republican Party, uh, despite their being anti-socialists or anti-communists, who have ties 
and uh, trying to normalize relationships with Cuba, including looking at the issue of Guantanamo, which is Cuban territory, of how that get resolved, because ultimately that will set the basis for a full uh, normalization of relations. An important issue at this moment, because if the anti, if the popular anti-Trump uh, electoral front is successful in removing Trump, it will mean likely the reemergence of the agreement between pres then President Raul Castro and then President Barack Obama to set the framework for additional steps towards full bilateral relations. I point out these various directions, these various sectors, these various ideological outlooks, uh, which are not my ultimate outlook, but are important material factors for us to deal with in negotiating our way forward. And so that kind of mapping needs to be done to really nurture that, uh, to build the kind of vibrancy that you uh, are, are asking for, uh, not only in your generation, but your generation as the dynamic leadership now connected to uh, your parents, uh, your grandparents connected to people like me. I would suggest that at the moment we're in a specific situation given, given the political characteristics of global capital in the midst of the pandemic with the black masses in a sort of perpetual state of uprising at the moment over police violence and prisons and policing that it is a recipe to really reinvigorate interest in Cuba in the way that they have handled the pandemic in showing the differences in racial progress uh, and racial treatment, not to say that it's perfect in Cuba for black Cubans and black people, but I see this moment as definitely a teachable and educational moment, right? The potential is there. It's sort of up to us to do that. But I'm curious, in a 1999 essay of yours, you wrote that much of the solidarity with Cuba, especially and particularly from the Black community in the U.S., has not been character, excuse me, characteristically ideological or for the sake of building socialism, but more so focused on racial progress um, and Afro-Cuban culture. And I see that, you know, it could be a two-sided sword. Of course, the racial progress and the cultural aspect are important. But when we think about material economic needs, sanctions, and, and these kind of things, we have to think in much broader and, and more scientific terms. And do you agree and do you see this moment as being really the moment to push it beyond the racial progress and Afro-Cuban cultural conversation and dive in once again to, to a more deeper, uh, I guess, not just conversation, because I'm personally tired of conversations. I'm ready to build and to work and to continue doing. Um, but I really do see this. I recently spoke with Mumia Abu-Jamal, political prisoner. Um, and he said, right now we're in a moment of convergence. And whenever we're in a moment of convergence, he said that that's the perfect time to do work. And so I, I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Well, there's a lot packed there. I wrote that uh, essay in, I think it was the second issue of, um, Souls Magazine then from Columbia University, which was uh, developed by the late um, a Democratic Socialist scholar uh, uh, Manning Marable. Um, and the, the title of that essay in 1999 was Reflections on Race in Cuba. And then I did point out that uh, the great attraction from my vantage point of African Americans to the Cuban Revolution was around the promise of overcoming uh, racism. Well, this dates back, going way back, I'll just give one reference to the Frederick Douglass, who uh, looking at Antonio Maceo, the bronze titan who led the revolutionary army in Cuba against Spain, and which uh, Frederick Douglass uh, was saying, let's African-Americans organize to go and support uh, uh, Antonio Maceo and those revolutionary initiatives because it has great promise uh, for uh, black humanity keeping in mind this whole continent is racialized capitalism from the very beginning of colonialism and the founding of all of uh, uh, those colonies that then went on to, to 
defeat uh, the metropoles from Europe, France, Britain, Portugal, in order to develop these new republics. And then in many of those instances, including in Cuba and Venezuela with Simon Bolivar, and, uh, it was uh, African Americans, uh, freed uh, enslaved people who were in many instances freed so that they could become the revolutionary army uh, to make that difference in building these new national cultures. That is the legacy, if you will, of which we are living. I think Ajam, uh, uh, um, Mumal makes a very, very important point about this moment of convergence. And I think we need to evaluate that from the point of view of actually what is happening. Two very resonant global issues are running virally, if you will, around the world. One has to do with COVID-19 in which it has brought the entire world together and revealed uh, the class nature, the problems of private property, uh, the fact that people of color, women in that context are the most exploited, the most imprisoned, the, the most vulnerable uh, towards this disease. But it has also elevated little Cuba, uh, 11 million people in a world of 7 billion as the great humanitarian national perspective about global solidarity, not just in rhetoric, but in one preparing themselves internally to providing socialized healthcare and education to their own population. And with their meager resources, meaning first meager natural resources, they don't have a lot of natural resources to work with. What they have is great ethics, a great sense of humanity, and great examples, contradictory as they may be at various times that they have built, that they not only offer to the world, but they actually take around the world. And that is such a powerful material, instrumentalized attraction that even developed Western countries who are anti-Cuban socialism have asked, who please come and help us. Here in the United States, I'm involved with a project significantly catalyzed by Code Pink, uh, one of our stellar public space transformative uh, organizations, mass organizations, uh, to uh, award the no a Nobel recognition uh, to the humanitarian effort of the Cuban Medical Brigade. But that brigade is situated uh, from men and women coming out of Cuban households, that then the Cuban socialist government provides the educational background for in order to uh, uplift their training, not only for their immediate communities and nation, but for the entire world. Uh, so that this is a moment of convergence and new possibilities because we as a global community are not going to be able to go back to the old normal as much as uh, liberals and right-wing thinkers will try to drag us all back there, the revitalization of the traditional Republican Party that, that Joe Biden and others are involved in to defeat Trump, which we want to do, uh, but at the same time to be against the insurgents of the Democratic Socialists of America and not to go as far in our relationships with Cuba as we, as, as we might. So again, these are some of the contradictory issues that emerge, but the, here are some of the straight line projections, and I'm, uh, Jamal is correct in, in having talked about this convergence. And it's on us now to actualize that based on what is going on. And again, not to be trapped with, with simple critique about what might be going on. Absolutely. And, and when I think of specific policy like the blockade, or the Helms-Burton Act and how these, this policy and these imperialist actions wreak havoc to the island and, and are quite violent and devastating. It's often hard to communicate the level of devastation that the sanctions have um, on the island to people in the US. For example, in the pandemic, as Luna said in the introduction, sanctions have actually increased and the situation has for many Cubans become dire, but it's not random, right? These are because of specific choices that have been implemented. This is because of a linear progression of imperialist aggression. I mean, a, a linear progression of imperialist aggression. <laughs> I'm on quarantine brain, it's hard to, <laughs> to speak today. 
Um, and often with the Walter Rodney Foundation, so much of our work gears around political education, specifically with the black community in Atlanta and online. And that has been a hurdle for me in my political education and educating the black community is how to make it relevant, how to make them understand that these imperialist violences are actually in tandem with and converging with and are not completely distinct from the violences which they may face in their daily life or which we're seeing uprisings happening around the world. I've used the example of the Helms Burton Act before in my political education to sort of use it as an example to highlight the egregious and almost paradoxical nature of US policy against Cuba. And for those who may not know, the Helms Burton Act essentially allows for business owners and corporations who may have lost uh, land and property in the revolution to effectively sue Cuba for that property. But I'm curious when it comes to this black community specifically, if throughout your time doing this organization, there have been any points that you have noticed, points of success in doing this education work more effectively to make those connections in our education? Well, emanating from Cuba first and foremost for many years in Cuba has reinstituted some aspects of this um, dating back probably to in the 80s that, and, and there probably are uh, instances in which I'm, I'm not aware of. Uh, Casa de las Americas, which is one of the most important um, intellectual centers uh, on our globe, not to mention our hemisphere, um, would have um, uh, conferences, gatherings of inviting uh, not only African Americans, but Asian Pacific Americans and Latinos from the United States to come and exchange ideas uh, about issues of social justice and, and, and new directions. Uh, that is still uh, being done or has been revised certainly with the Latino communities. Uh, we have to explore those channels and um, really talk to young high school students uh, as well as college students. Uh, there are many, many college professors all over the United States as well as students, both undergraduates and graduate students who want to go and do research in Cuba. And uh, we have to figure out how to one aid and support them by doing that, by changing US law, by uh, working with them and raising funds to do that. But also being very direct with the Cubans about what our interests are. Uh, I'm gonna veer a little here because um, there is a tendency, I believe, on the part of progressives and of socialists. Um, there's some connection between the two terminology, but I don't use them synonymously. Uh, to talk about Cuba in ideal terms. Uh, there is a struggle against racism that has been going on in Cuba since the revolution. It is going on in the context of, a, of an evolving socialist society, which is distinct from any other socialist uh, national project, I would say, on this planet. The Cubans have been much, much more forthright and engaging about their socialist ideas and how their society is developing, then I would say uh, the Chinese. Uh, that is not to push the Chinese aside. One, because you can't push them aside. They are the weight of the world. And for your generation, they are going, they will be a pivot that we will have to engage in similar ways that we have in, engaged Cuba. But we have to look at what is going on inside Cuba to figure out how best to engage Cuba. So that no matter what I say or others outside of Cuba say are right, the most important dialogue that goes on about issues of life and development and specifically race here in Cuba is among Cubans. Uh, we have to pay attention to that. Uh, we have to be patient and try to understand it. We certainly will have individualized opinions, but the most important opinions are those of the Cubans. And in that context, we have to try to make an assessment from wherever we are outside of Cuba. What seems to be the most progressive edge in the context of how Cubans are discussing, debating, mediating, proposing policies and projects to take up this issue? Now, what I have uh, witnessed over the last uh, at least 10 years, that uh, Cuban uh, who identify themselves uh, as Afro-Cubans or as Mestizos, um, 
have taken much more uh, activism uh, to speak out about how they see life as regards the issues of race and culture. Uh, there are many manifestations today in Cuba about issues of cultural heritage, not only from a historical point of view, but from a contemporary point of view of something as basic but as important in everyday life as when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, how do I look? How do I feel about myself? What is my latitude to work with my African descended hair, my black skin, um, the kinds of clothes that would be re representative of, of my Yoruba culture, which is very pervasive in various ways throughout Cuba. That is a very important act of citizenship, of proactive citizenship, uh, of uh, rather than representative democracy, of participatory democracy. That is now being reflected, not in a one-to-one -one ratio, but is being reflected inside parastatals, it has been for a while, as well as inside the Cuban government. So Color Cubano, which was originated uh, well over a decade now, I guess, um, in um, the Union of Artists and Writers by Isela Arandia, ran its course. Then a new development under Feraldi um, and others in um, the Union of Writers and, and Artists uh, d uh, developed the Jose Aponte project, which was originally called the Commission Against Racism and Discrimination, but sometime shortly thereafter, historicized it uh, through the significant um, uh, uh, Afro-Cuban uh, who had been enslaved, who, who rebelled uh, Jose Aponte. Uh, and this is 2020, in uh, July 2019, Danny Glover, the actor, activist, and I, met for the second time um, with now President Diaz Canals. We had met with him uh, in 1970 for about three hours to talk about the issues of racial identity, uh, racism and discrimination, and policy from the point of view of socialism, not to try to instruct him on how to carry that out, but to raise a critique that the need for the Cubans to be in these networks across Latin America as Afro-descendants are grappling with this Cuba is a unique experience in its achievements, uh, taking its ethics and actually doing things in real life, and, at the, and in its own self-identified errors and failures from which we can learn. And this debate that is going on in Cuba, not only about the issues of race, but other policy issues is very refreshing. This is one of the things we need to uplift and to say uh, to young people, look at the engagement, the debate going on among Cuban citizens uh, inside the Communist Party, inside the government, not between them as three distinct elements, but across all of that, uh, this, this is the democracy issue within socialism uh, that the government actually is promoting, that we need to have more debate. Raul Castro, one of the first things he said when he was approved by the National Assembly to be the president of the country. He was not approved because he was Fidel's brother uh, by itself. He was approved by the National Assembly. He says, we have too little debate. We need more debate in this country. We're not going back to capitalism, but the question is how is socialism functioning? If it's not functioning in your life, say so. If you have a critique it, if you have a proposal, we would love to hear it, but you don't need to have a proposal. You just need to have an opinion and that we who are in the policy area must be patient. We must listen. We must solve problems. And so that you have seen a decentralization of power, uh, the power of governance is decentralized through the provinces in Cuba. These are the evolutionary uh, maturation issues within the Cuban revolution that we need to talk not only to young people about, but uh, to people across the United States and other places in the world. Look inside the dynamics of the Cuban socialist society and its revolution, see how they are mediating their lives. And therein is where we can extract issues of principles, not models. We have to, everybody has developed, you know, Hugo Chavez was very, very clear that 21st century socialism had to be plural. And he loved Cuba and loved Fidel Castro. But by implication, he was saying that you have to develop your life out of the circumstances in which you live, notwithstanding how common they may be with other nations, there are distinctions in the way that your nation has evolved and 
how you feel. And that's the context out of which you need to mature the socialist society of these plural expressions, not one motto. So this is a very important moment in which uh, activism among Cuban Afro descendants are raising with their country uh, men and country women of all uh, racial backgrounds, the significance of racial identity, the significance of discrimination, the importance of taking it on. And it is being reflected by these developments with the government, uh, with Diaz Canals uh, not asking someone to go off from the government to do this, but by inaugurating a presidential com uh, commission, which he convenes. Now the challenge is then on the citizen. The public stewards have said, something we understand is not right here, despite whatever achievements we have made. And in many of these instances, I would say uh, uh, my observation from afar is that many of the Afro-descendant citizens uh, within Cuba, while they have legitimate critiques, they tend not to want to engage the government. Well, this is a government uh, who are public servants. They get voted on. Those, those Afro-Cubans do vote. Uh, so they're, they're public servants. And so that they have, a, in my view, a responsibility to extend themselves even further in their critical engagement with their public stewards. And their public stewards obviously have a responsibility to pay more attention or give direct attention to this new flowering of uh, Afro-descendant voices uh, literally across Cuba. Uh, Club Espendru, uh, Diago the Artist. Uh, there, there are many more expressions that I'm aware of, but this is a dynamic moment. Absolutely, it is a dynamic moment. And I believe one of the most eye-opening experiences in traveling to Cuba and working with the Red Barrial is seeing how the notion of grassroots is very different in Cuba in this active socialist project. The grassroots is in constant communication and dialogue and push and pull, a, a, a positive push and pull and generative push and pull typically with the state and with their public representatives and, and, and their elected officials in a way such that it does generate very productive outcomes. One example I'll briefly give is in La Marina de Matanzas, which is a small neighborhood in Matanzas, Cuba. It's actually the birthplace of Rumba. Los, Los Muñequitos de Matanzas have their studio. They're a Latin Grammy winning Rumba collective. They have their studio there. This neighborhood is home of so much African culture and Afro-Cuban culture. And about a decade ago, they felt like they were being overlooked in their local history books and their history text and in the archives. The cuisines they had created, the traditions, the religions, all of this they felt were being overlooked. So they came together to create a social cartography. And what they did was led by uh, Maritza Lopez McBean and Raul uh, Kimbo Dominguez, they interviewed hundreds of local residents to learn landmarks, traditions, cuisines, what um, the Yoruba altars were, the different trees and what people offered to the Orishas. And they put this all into a map and created a social cartography of it. And it was so successful, they presented it to their local representatives. And within a year, it was actually many of these findings were adopted into the actual historical um, archive. And so this is just one example of how what we conceive of as activism outside of Cuba in the West as often being little more than protests and demonstrations, and then sometimes mutual aid support when, it, when we need it, their sort of conception of activism and the grassroots comes in a much different context. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you believe that we are at a point right now where, where we can move towards that different context and actually construct similar projects like this that have lasting impacts, um, given that we have this almost reinvigoration of the notion of mutual aid that has been sprung upon us, right? Well, you mean we here in the United States, are we in terms of internal to the United States is, is, the, is yeah. that the other question? Yeah, well, sorry. Um, 
we certainly are at a, um, a, a distinctive moment uh, in American history, not just in, in my lifetime. Um, one of the indices to that is the now perhaps all too frequent commentary that uh, the Black Lives Matter in its broad multiple expressions is the largest protest movement that, that we've seen in the history of the United States. Uh, whether that's true or false, the qualitative dimensions of that is what is important. And by that, it means that we see not only uh, young uh, radical African-Americans in the public space talking about um, structural and systemic racism and even using the term radical on MSNBC and other places, but we see middle-class black people, middle-class white people. Uh, this has been such a powerful democratic dynamic that it has even leveraged a so-called moderate Republicans having to step forth and say, yes, black lives matter. Uh, this is not, this is less a testimony to the individual's uh, expressions of this than it is to suggest that there is really a crisis uh, that has come together with COVID-19 that has revealed the racialized and feminized con fundamental contradictions in this society because it is the nurses who are women and significantly Caribbean American citizens, Latina American citizens, South African English speaking American citizens who, who and Filipina women citizens in this country who are working in these hospitals. If you look on uh, the, at least the liberal side of the mass media, uh, the doctors that are coming on are significantly Southeast Asian American citizens. Uh, we know who the bus drivers are and the train drivers are. They're largely black and Latino. And so this is all being revealed in very empirical ways that theory heretofore has not been able to lift people's consciousness in some ways, that now people are beginning to be more and more conscious about that. And so that we are seeing people and their solidarity and their self-help pro projects. But ultimately, there is a fundamental distinction between what is going on in Cuba and what is going on here. And that is the general outlook of society in Cuba whatever its contradictions are, and Cubans from the Communist Party to the Cuban government and certainly Cuban citizens will point out to you their complaints and their contradictions. Their trajectory of humanity uh, is an uplifting one, is a dynamic one in practice. Here we are constrained by the market economy and we see the brakes being put on. Let's put people back to work in the context of this dangerous pandemic which means that it is people of color and women who will die even at higher proportions than we are dying now. That is the crude, vulgar social Darwinism that is being promoted, certainly by Republicans. Uh, but the so-called liberals neither are talking about the ultimate systemic nature, which is this political economy that does not function. It functions for the elite and so they want to go back to a kind of welfare state that we're going to have poor people. They're going to be significantly poor uh, people of color and women, but they won't be treated as crudely as they are under the extremism uh, of, of the Trump administration. So, th so the, the, the analogs with, between these common initiatives, the Paolo Freirian initiatives inside uh, Cuba were people take control of their own lives and inform governance about what policies they need rather than wait for governance to, to, to bring them and let them be beneficiaries uh, of public servants can only go so far. It raises the question for us here, we must get down to the fundamental contradictions in this society that also then lead to cutting us off from the humanity and the concrete projects that have been expressed in Cuba from which the Cubans have always offered to provide assistance in hurricanes and things of that sort. And they have some basic requirements. You must respect who we are and not interfere with who we are. And from that vantage point, we can find points of mutual uh, interest, beneficial interest in improving the quality of life. And certainly with the issues of healthcare, the issues of literacy, uh, but the, 
basic issues of ethics and politics. And again, Cuba is no paradise. Uh, as a Cubans will be the first to tell you that and to point out the contradiction. So I will not spend time giving you my opinion of, of where those contradictions are. But I listen as often as I can, which is almost daily, to the various vectors of Cuban society and how they're identifying their strengths and in that context, how they, you, this is their terminology, and how in that context they are identifying their own errors and their own failures. When Raul Castro came to, to be the presidency, he said, this blockade is killing us. But if he were to remove the blockade today, we would be in serious trouble because of our own errors and our own failures. That is a refreshing human uh, self-reflection in the context of obvious virtues and strengths and accomplishments uh, that the Cubans can point to concretely both inside their society and their society's contribution to the uplift of other uh, societies and other nations. Absolutely, and I, I remember Idelcia Alfonso, who's an incredible researcher and community organizer in Cuba, who is actually preserving an African language in her small community. Um, she said to me one time that we have to, in the US, rethink this notion of the grassroots that we have held on to for so long. And we have to instead look at the actual machinery. This is her words, the actual machinery of what confines us. And I find that to be a powerful way of saying you have to look at the material condition, conditions and the, as you said, the contradictions, the irreconcilable contradictions. And of course, this is where you get into differences of ideology and action and whatnot. But I think that's sort of an ultimate truth right there. Let me, let me add one additional point here. You know, for 32 years, I've worked at the National Museum of the United States in, in various positions and uh, played, according to Cuba's own documentation, a, a, a contribu contributory role in uh, extending um, what is now a historical connection between uh, Cuba and the Smithsonian Institution since the founding of the Smithsonian Institution in the late 1800s, in which one of the primary collections in the Museum of Natural History uh, at the Smithsonian came from Cuba, and the Cubans have been documenting that going back and forward. So in the context of my work, which is basically involved with uh, folklore, folk communities, the imagination, uh, the creativity, the determination of grassroots communities to actualize their lives, one of the astounding things that my fellow researchers always talk about, Cuba has probably more documentation since the revolution of grassroots community expressions than almost any country. Little resources, big problems of, of transportation, of having enough uh, petrol to cross the island and so forth, but extraordinary documentation, a cartography uh, on a CD that goes back maybe almost 20 years ago coming out of the Centro Juan Marinello, about mm -hmm. all of these culinary traditions and dance traditions and worship traditions and sewing traditions, um, which comes out of the imagination and the creativity of the Cuban people. So the Cuban citizens have a great resource in their ministry of culture, whatever other contradictions may exist in, between, in that relationship, to call, and they have a, an extraordinarily uh, well-trained, group of cultural researchers, of ethnographers, ethnomusicologists, and the like, uh, to work with Cuban citizenry to, to, to actually document and uplift those things. So it is heartening to see that the state apparatus and its capacity, which has produced so very, very much in grassroots art and culture by way of documentation, now has that possibility through the proactivity, the participatory democracy initiatives of ordinary Cubans who are documenting themselves to call on uh, the infrastructure of the state to intersect with them. There are great, great possibilities there. Absolutely, and I know that I would be remiss not to say and to point out, and I think you would agree to some extent that um, so many of the contributions have been led by black Cuban women and Cuban women in general, the Cuban Federation of Women being an example. Uh, the, the African studies and African-American studies 
uh, department of the Casa de las Americas is ran by Zulaika, who is a black woman. Mm -hmm. I could go on and on. I think of Nomi Ramirez, who's the black trans woman who's at the aid of Mariela Castro at Cinesex, and they're pushing conversations on race and gender and sexuality. And they're pushing these conversations and organizing around it in ways that are very advanced and creative. Um, again, because the context and, and the, the conditions have called for that in a way, right? And they have sort of- they, they, Right, the, the internal conditions, you know, uh, you know, the development of the Federation of Cuban Women, again, was one of the most extraordinary uh, civil society state uh, the, uh, emergence out in, in the early years of the Cuban Revolution. And of course, Cinesex, Raul Castro, uh, Mariela Castro, uh, and developing that. But Cuba has evolved beyond that kind of, uh, although Cinesex is not a state-directed institution, it was an individual who did, did that in the case of Mariela Castro. And, but in the case of the Cuba, Federation of Cuban Women, one of the things that we have to recognize, and it's in an analog here with race, as I would observe it from afar, is that those were state instrumentalities. The state in the initial period of the revolution did not sanction racial uh, groupings, uh, civil society expressions. They declared, appropriately so, it, it illegal to racially discriminate and that the material circumstances of the country and access belong to everyone. But the fundamental issue of democracy is the initiative of the demos, the citizen, the ordinary person, the quasha of that democracy, the power of vision, articulation, and creativity of citizens. So we're seeing an evolution of the Cuban uh, socialist revolution and we're now we're having more of a flowering and this has been a long discussion within the Communist Party of Cuba, of that we have this highly educated population, not only by our very uh, uh, proud uh, reflections as Cubans, but the United Nations in its most objective state will tell you, Cuba is one of the most educated populations in the world. And that is not by comparison to states of, of equal size and resources. It is compared to the most developed highly rich countries and the Cubans have produced. So now we're seeing a new evolution within the Cuban revolution and where this active emphasis on a participatory democracy, citizens are becoming more expressive about their agency and the government is looking more as public stewards, how to provide that kind of engagement by, by taking the singular responsibility of the state to look broadly across the nation for the being estatic the well-being for all of the different areas of Cuba, whether you're on the coast or living up in the mountains or, or whether you're in a forest area or a, a small aldea, small village or, or a larger town, uh, people in those respective distinct areas don't have the, res the wherewithal or the responsibility to take a national view in a very concrete way. But that is the role of governance, is to have the panoramic view of the interests, aspirations, the needs of a society, and then to make the proposal of what is in the best interest, because despite utopian aspirations, you can't give everybody everything they want. But the question is, can you give help facilitate enough that it runs in sort of virally to help uplift the entire society? So this is a very important moment internally, the way that Cubans are handling their revolution and this active voice. And race is a, is a central uh, uh, issue uh, on that. And of course, the Ministry of Culture in the state plays an important role. I'll stop on this point because Tamas Magazine, one of the most important public space, uh, proactive citizen-driven initiatives for many, many years, um, asked me some three, four years ago, five years ago, no, I guess it was a little more than five years ago, to write an introduction to uh, 20 years of articles that they had published by Cubans looking at the issue of race in Cuba. And I had not accepted to do this before because my, my principle and the principle I want to communicate to people who may be listening to this in the United States and engaging this, first listen to the Cubans, how they're handling their own debates and issues and what compromises they reach. But for some reasons I won't go into right now, I agreed to do that. And one of the things I pointed out is because the Cubans posit that the fundamental issue of racism in Cuban society today is in the cultural 
uh, area in the superstructure, as Marxists might say, of, of, of jokes and prejudices that are reproduced in, in homes. And I raise the question that if it is as pervasive as the thesis coming out of the research of the Cuban anthropology department uh, has said, to what extent when those people go to work Monday through Friday, does it become a public space systemic nature? And that ultimately the question of uh, racial identity, uh, racism and discrimination is not one of whether we don't say bad things about one another, that we don't make jokes about one another, but what is the quality of life? And herein the work of Esteban Morales Dominguez in my reading is significantly important because he is a communist, a black communist, uh, Afro-Cuban descendant communist, I'll let him describe himself, um, who has done, um, I think, the most important connection between historical and materialist examination of the issues of race within the revolution. And just a year and a half or so ago, uh, he said to the Cuban foreign ministry that the annual report that is produced at the UN on the uplift of Cuban society, including anti-racist perspectives, must index that by color, not abstractly that the revolution has uplifted uh, the great masses of the Cuban people, which it has done. But if you don't look at the correlation between skin color and actual material circumstances of life, he said, you don't know how wonderful this revolution actually is, but more importantly, you don't know what are concretely, specifically, not ideologically, but in real terms, what are the ongoing challenges and around which groups of people, not abstractly Afro descendants are mestizos, but in specific areas of the country, so that then the stewards of governance can help to correlate more directly where the actuality of need and get out of this bipolar kind of thing that there are black Cubans and there are white Cubans. That is far too simplified as it is even in the United States that there are black and white people or Latino people or queer people. You have to get inside of those categories and look at the actual circumstances and where the need is and where the agency by the citizens themselves so that they are not simple beneficiaries of the role of the state, but they are active collaborating partners with the stewards that, have been, that, that they have elected that come out of their households across the nation. And definitely. And I believe with the new announcement that D.S. Cannell had last year that of the new racial initiative that, that the state is taking place, the hope is that it will be that collaborative partnership where there's real engagement taking place um, and it brings excitement, but also, you know, hesitation from the grassroots as well. But it does bring hesitation, which from afar, I must say that I'm concerned with. I'm in communication with some of the people that you know and perhaps see more frequently than I do, who I think are raising legitimate issues about discrimination and the need for uh, education and so forth and so on. And my question to them is, are you engaging your public servants? And so far too often I hear, well, I'm, that's not going anywhere. The last one didn't go anywhere. Well, it won't go where you think it might go if you don't challenge it. And, and, and if it is not open to saying, wow, that's a better idea than our commission had. It is now a national idea. That is the, the dialectic of democracy or the linkage between the citizenry and the public stewards who are in charge of governance. And that's why the discourse in Latin America, which has been taken up uh, within Cuba in the last decade or more of a participatory democracy, not just a representative democracy of Fidel said, or Raul said, or Diaz Canal said, important as what they have said may, may be, it is what do you think? How are you going to engage that? What are you saying to uh, the president of the country about what you think? That is what Diaz Canals as a former a minister of education uh, as a former head of a couple of provinces where you really have to build the bridge when it gets washed out. You can't theorize about it. You know, uh, you, you just can't speak in generality. You have to put roofs on houses uh, when the hurricane comes off. Uh, you can't say, well, our plans are. He has been consistent in saying to public servants, we must produce change we must be patient and listen to the citizenry. We must engage the participation 
of citizens. So this is a really important democracy new evolution, not the first democracy there, but it is a new evolution of a democracy perspective uh, inside Cuba that those of us outside Cuba should pay attention to because what we're seeing in the streets right now in the United States, again, under this broad multifaceted banner of Black Lives Matter, which has catalyzed all of these people, these are not just protesters demanding change. They are protesting, they are demanding, and they are formulating policy. And for the moment, they are leveraging the stewards of governance to respond to them. Now, the stewards of governance, both liberal, moderate, and right wing are trying to take those reins. Right. <laughs> they wait, wait, wait. We are the ones who will determine this. And so we don't know how long we can sustain that dynamic. But here's a qualitative difference with what is going on in Cuba. The Cuban government is saying critical participation by citizens to the stewards of governance is what will take this society to the next uh, mature, maturing of, of our social society of benefiting all of us. And so that is a qualitative difference. It, it is, absolutely. And I hope that the people watching this understand that it is up to the writers, the cultural workers, the community organizers, the researchers and academics to not be afraid to do the work of building solidarity with Cuba and doing work for Cuba, sometimes with nothing in return also, which is another important note that I don't think we have time to maybe go down but not being afraid of being called a Cuban communist as I've been called before and not being afraid of, of whatever backlash happens and, and understanding that it is up to us to take these lessons, document them and distribute them alongside Cubans and in conversation and while listening to Cubans. I think that's one of the most important takeaways. It, it is indeed, and I know our time might be running out, but this is the importance of your generation doing a cartography here in the United States. Absolutely. Of, of mapping in the United States, in the mainstream in particular, the, the, Stan, the, 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 the Sandra Levinson's uh, and, and the, 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 the Cuban art uh, uh, institution. The many years, uh, I have never read anything she's written about socialism. I don't know what she thinks about that, but I do see the impact uh, with her and, and Cubans in collaboration of great arts, great aesthetics, great humanistic support for, for one another. Uh, there are centers uh, like that throughout the United States on college campuses and communities. I mentioned Minnesota earlier, of dance companies, uh, of jazz groups. Uh, many, many years ago, I took a group of uh, youngsters, some of them not even yet teenagers with their parents. We actually broke the law got into Cuba for the jazz festival, got through all of the bureaucracy of the United States and of Cuba and arrived and the Cuban says, so, so you're here. They, and they put these youngsters <laughs> in the jazz festival. So these things are doable from the vantage point of citizens, but we need to know where we are and we need to see how vibrant the, the existing relationships are. And then from there we can build. Because again, critical idealism of always saying, uh, it's the bottle is half full. It means we don't know how it got half full. We are just looking at uh, what we think needs to be done without building on what has been done. The Rosemary Mealy's uh, of of the world and the kind of work uh, that that she has done, and her husband Sam Anderson and uh, Gail uh, Reed, and 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 from the U.S. and Cuba through medical uh, issues, members of Congress, and including members. Uh, of the Republican Party, moderates in the Republican Party who want to do business with Cuba, Republican governors who want to sell rice to Cubans. The Cubans would rather buy that rice and pork bellies and chicken uh, than to have to go all the way to Vietnam or China. There are very practical things in here that we should be careful not to let uh, philosophy and ideology and idealism obscure uh, those, those really day-to-day -day necessities but keep a straight line as Cuba has that we want to build a new humanity because that's what they are doing. Yes, it has contradictions. They will be the first to tell you, but they're sharing the benefits of what they are doing with the entire world. And the, the, the Henry Rees Brigade is right now in the context of this convergence that Abu Jamal talked about uh, is the most significant example of a solidary humanism, which we can emulate 
and certainly from which we can benefit from if we force our government to stop this economic uh, sanction blockade war against Cuba and uh, open up uh, pe respectful people to people relations. Well, I think we're at our time limit right now. It's been, that's a perfect place to end. I think that we covered a lot of ground in a short time. I wanna thank you so much for speaking with me and for your time today. I wanna thank you all for your leadership. And, and I just wanna just to recap and just thank both of you um, for your deep knowledge of um, not only on the ground grassroots organizing in Cuba, which is very complex. And I think you did an amazing job at speaking to that, but also the political, like actual political material realities that are happening in Cuba. Um, and I just wanna highlight two things that I heard cause I, I was very moved. Um, first off on uh, James Early, you said it's on us to actualize the conversions based on what's going on and not be stuck in critique of what might be going on. Um, and that I think really speaks to this moment right now of like uh, there are material realities happening in the United States in this moment, very, very impacting a lot of people. Um, creating death um, on, on uh, people. And, and I think the realities of anti-Blackness in the United States are becoming very, very um, strong. And at the same time, there is what Devin um, has described as linear progression of imperial aggression um, okay. throughout the world. And, um, you know, there's, it's both. It's, it's Black people and people of color in the United, and immigrants um, and undocumented people in the United States being uh, a target of of horrible U.S. policy, but also people across the globe being a horrible, being targets of horrible U.S. policy. So I, I really appreci appreciate both of you bringing um, this dialogue. And, and um, the one last thing I wanted to highlight was that we do have to be patient. We have to listen to Cubans. I think that's very difficult um, because of a language barrier and also a technological barrier. Cubans do not have access to Zoom without using a VPN because of the US embargo. And that's something that is not accessible to everyone. So um, it is important that we are able to highlight these realities in a nuanced way through people who speak English and um, who can provide this, the context that, that we otherwise wouldn't have because it's, it is hard um, uh, to just understand Cuba if you've never been there. Um, so I appreciate it. And, and again, we, we are doing this work uh, collectively, a lot of people, not just Belly of the Beast, but Belly of the Beast is supporting the work of um, highlighting the realities of Cubans, um, the everyday realities that, that are caused by uh, the, the people that we vote in to, to, to government and the, and the tax money that gets taken out of our checks every month. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, so thank you both. Um, and thank you again to the People's Forum. Yeah, Thank definitely. Thank you so much. Very good. Hasta la próxima. Y venceremos.